Hi, everyone. I'm your last to act. No, just kidding. I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. We are going to talk about something different. We're going to talk about big data business models. We're not talking about APIs. We're not talking about schema. We're not talking about database columns, row storage. We're not talking about any of that stuff. We're going to be talking about business models, how you can take this back and make a difference. So we're going to start by talking what's going on in the marketplace. Four big things are happening. Everybody knows this. Everybody feels this. The first part, macroeconomic conditions. Things are crazy, right? Oil prices, government shutdowns, right? War, civil unrest. You can't control those. Just know that. You cannot control those. But there are three things that are happening that are changing the way we use data, that are changing the way our consumer lives are coming back to our personal lives. And this is what gets exciting. Think about the way you work. There are five generations of workers in every organization, from digital natives to digital immigrants. People communicate differently. They think about things differently. Where you work, when you work, how you work, even why you work, all different. And that is changing the way we use information in the workforce. That's the way we change things and we start to figure out context about people, what those relationships are like. And that's a big shift. Just think about this. A company like JetBlue, how many of you guys have heard of JetBlue? JetBlue, when you call the contact center to make a reservation, wait, there isn't a contact center. There's someone in bunny slippers and a laptop. They're connected to the internet. That's all that matters. That's what we're talking about. That's the type of shift that's happening. The third thing that we have here is really business models. And we're going to spend a lot of time on business models. And the interesting thing about business models is they're being created, changed, shifted. Big data is playing a huge role in transforming how people do business. And we're going to spend a lot of time there, but let me give you an idea. At the height of the financial crisis in 2008, what was the symbol of American might, manufacturing worth? General Motors. What was the market cap of General Motors? Anybody want to take a guess? Four billion. That was it. General Motors was four billion after all its debts, liabilities, and obligations. What was Google worth? 100 million? Anyone else? 180 billion. The answer is close. It's 167 billion. What could Google do for fun on a weekend? Buy GM and shut them down? No, buy GM and have all their cars run with Google. No, but the point being is that's what we're talking about. The shift is in the information age. The shift is in digital. This is what's happening. And the last piece is really disruptive tech, tech adoption. We've seen this everywhere. This is social, mobile, cloud, big data, unified communications, but it's not on its own. It's this convergence that's happening. We're talking about social and mobile, what happens there. We're talking about what happens with big data and cloud and how we harness the compute power to get to decisions. We're talking about UC and video creating digital maps about how networks and relationships are happening, how information is being shared. That's the disruption. This is where we're seeing the excitement around where data to decisions are happening. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit of a story about disruption, what's happening, and what is a disruptive business model. And let's start here. What is this? A Sony Walkman. When did the Sony Walkman come out? Not 70, 80s, 80s, 84, close, 83. In 1983, think about that, 30 years ago, that was the last innovation from Sony. 30 years ago. This was disruptive, right? I cut lawns to pay for school. This is why it was so important having a Sony Walkman, right? You got the music, it was, it was neat, it was portable. It was the beginning of that portable lifestyle, that music lifestyle. I waited four years to buy this next thing, and it was $400. I had to go to Japan. When you count quantitative easing dollars, that's $1,200, all right, after inflation. The double cassette Walkman. Right, this is fun. So that was their incremental innovation, right? They added another player. You could put two cassette decks and the size of one. That's what made it interesting. Okay, everybody knows what this is. This is not what's innovative, right? What was interesting was at a time of crisis when music was free, iPod actually convinced you to pay a dollar for a song, right? They actually monetized the music, and that what was interesting. But more importantly is this device. 27 business models destroyed, never coming back again. All data-driven models, all gone. You don't go to a one-hour Photoshop 
to, deliver, to develop film, right? You don't buy music except on an online store. You don't go to a record store. You don't need a Garmin device. You don't spend $400 for a digital camera. You don't have a flip cam for video. All those things are gone. Everything is here. This is the interface. This is what we start out with, and that's the disruption. Those jobs are gone forever, but think about all the things that happen now on the device, and this is the platform. This is the platform that's changing that disruption. One device can do that. And guess what? Samsung wants to be Apple. Sony wanted to be Apple. Apple became Sony. Samsung puts out a phone every 35 days. Apple does one every two years, maybe. That's what we're talking about. The space of disruption is fast, and it's going to happen more and more, and big data is going to be the weapon that gets you there. There's big data, there's small data, there's any of this. We'll talk about why. Now, the big shift here is really the shift to business models. You don't sell products anymore. People don't buy products. We did a deal for 1,000 laptops five weeks ago. What's the winning bid for a standard PC set of laptops in the office? How many think it's worth $300? Raise your hands. $500? Raise your hands per laptop. $1,000? OK, it's negative 100. <laughs> Just wanted to trick you. What are you buying? Are you buying the laptop? No, you're buying the service, the support. What else? Software, all the things that come around the laptop. Services companies, they're not even selling service anymore. They're selling experiences. They're selling a guarantee to get there. And that's very different, right? And experience-based companies, they're selling peace of mind. And let me show you. So what is, and this is the important thing about business model disruption, you have to tie it back to metric. You have to tie it back to an ROI metric. What is the metric in the airline business that matters the most? Someone said safety, what else? What kind of capacity? Field capacity, what else? Arrive on time, it's revenue per passenger mile. That's all that matters. What we have on the bottom here is an Airbus A380. And in an Airbus A380, you put more butts in seats. It supports hub and spoke. You can go from San Francisco to London, Paris to New York, big kind of things. What's on top? What's the business model there? That's a Dreamliner. And when it's not on fire, no, just kidding, that's a Dreamliner. And what that does is it changes the way we fly. This is light materials, this is super fuel efficient. I can go from San Jose to Osaka. I can go from Beijing to um, Indianapolis if I want to. That's the whole point. And we're disrupting these business models. So here's what's important. Look at Siemens. They're not an engineering company anymore. They don't sell products. When you buy that machine, what is the business model here? That business model is scans. How much do I make per scan? And instead of selling you the business, a device for millions of dollars, they were selling you financing so you could buy it. They were selling you services that you could buy it. What you're buying now is basically peace of mind. They will keep that machine up and running for you for 99% of the time. And that might be $10 million to do that. And if you want 99.9, that's probably 15 million. The point being is they're selling you peace of mind. And what's more important is they now have data. They know that a community hospital might be doing 50 scans more than another hospital per day. Why is that? All that data is being communicated with each other. In fact, Siemens is not even, even selling this. They're selling you peace of mind and then they're selling you the consulting on the data. What machine is more efficient? Why is that machine more efficient? How come an academic medical center is running less efficient than a community hospital? That's the interesting thing. Siemens is now a big data company, right? Not a manufacturer. And this is where we're changing these business models. And this is why it's so disruptive. This is why I've got to think about things differently. And when we take this business model disruption point of view, you start realizing that your data is worth so much. It's just how you use it. Disney, what do they sell? Disney doesn't sell theme park tickets. It starts when you're a kid. It's a life cycle model. What Disney is selling you today is an experience. It's peace of mind. It starts when you're a kid and you get Disney diapers and you go to the first movie and then you get the VHS if you're old enough. Then you get this Blu-ray, right? You get the DVD and then you get the Blu-ray and then you buy it on Netflix. You buy the same freaking movie five times. But the data about the fact that you did that allows them to come back and sell it to you again when they become parents. And then when you get old, there's like a retirement community called Celebration that you might even be interested in after you take the Disney cruise. They're in the life cycle model. They're selling you from cradle to grave. 
And what's valuable at Disney is they're selling you that brand experience. And what's valuable? It's the big data. It's the information. It's the context. I know what your next life event is, and I'm going to target that. And you're not going to mind. You want to know it's all taken care of. And this is the power that we're talking about. This is the type of disruption that's happening in the marketplace. And what we're battling for right now isn't about who's got the coolest data, who's got the coolest brand. We're battling for wallet share. Everybody's competing. In every market you look at, there's number one, number two, maybe a number three, and everybody else. And if you are everybody else, you are looking for every angle you can to improve your margins, drive your revenue, get to the next level, come up with the new idea to get there. And that's what's powerful here. And so let's talk a little about future business models. Here's something we put into Harvard Business Review. You can look it up. It's moving from transactions to engagement. And the key thing you want to know here is that things are becoming contextual. But they can only be contextual if you've got the data. And so what's important here is we've gone from transactions, which we're tracking and automating things, to engagement. And engagement is about sensing and responding. It's about delivering information in real time. But we're going to move quickly away from that to experiential and to personal fulfillment systems like personal clouds. Someone here, we were talking about personal clouds earlier. We're getting it down to the level of context that we can personalize. And you know what's important? It's not real-time data. I don't care about real-time data. I'm swamped with information. I want right-time data. I want information delivered to me at the right time, which is contextual, whether it's a role, whether it's a relationship, whether it's my location, whether it's my time, whether I'm happy or not, what's my sentiment? Maybe you can predict what I want next. What's my intention? It's context. Context is king. Don't listen to those marketing guys that tell you content is. It's context. Context is what's driving everything. And when I've got context, I can target something that's relevant. You're not going to hate me. You want the relevancy. That's where we bring engagement to life. That's where we build different types of business models. And if you know if I don't like something, you won't show that to me. You won't offer that to me. And you'll do that every time. And the world of B2B and B2C, destroyed. Never going to be back together again because it's people-to-people -people networks that are emerging because you have the context of a relationship. And this is changing very quickly, right? So there's this whole notion of big data. We see this all over. These are all the companies in the world of big data. These are probably 30% of the sponsors here in this room, right? But they're data sources. They're here. Great. How do we do? What do we do with that stuff? There are all these people working on that. There are people working on how do I plumb this? This is information and orchestration. Do I tie this to an upstream store? Do I bring it to downstream stores? Do I take care of lineage? What's important here? Then we get to the smart stuff. And the smart stuff is about insights. What questions do I ask? What patterns have emerged? What deterministic and probabilistic models are applied here that pop up? That's where it gets interesting. And then why are we doing this again? We forget this. We're all lost in big data. We're doing this because we're trying to make the next best action. What's the decision? What do I give a clerk in front of them to say, oh my god, that's our loyal customer. And they bought 15 of these. We shouldn't offer that to them again. right? We're trying to get it to that level. And this is the path. It's not about big data. Ken talked about this earlier. It's about making the right decisions. We are going from data to decisions. See that data? Structured, unstructured, big, lots of it, super amounts of velocity, veracity. Give me a million Vs, I don't care. That's happening. People are massaging that to happen. Then I've got to tie this to upstream, downstream sources. It's got to connect to something. And once it connects, I now have information hopefully cleansed, hopefully high quality, hopefully mastered. And when it's mastered, I can create insights. I can look for patterns. I can find out why do people like red sweaters in Alabama and blue in Michigan? Might be the state schools. Could be. I don't know. Let's figure that out, right? What happens, right? And you start seeing patterns. And then from there, that's the actions. And it's this data to decisions pathway that is the most important thing. You can apply it to any vertical, any industry. This is where we make a difference. And this is why you're doing big data or analytics or predictive. I don't care what you call us. It's a data to decision pathway that we're trying to achieve. And this is why we've got all these big data business models showing up. 
And if you go back to the handy dandy Harvard Business Review again, there's a piece we wrote on what a big data business model is. And I'm gonna show you three examples of something that work right away that your clients that you can take or put to market or take to market and be successful with. The first one is information-based differentiation. How many guys use Google Maps? That's everybody, all right? We're here in the Bay Area. Google Maps, how many use it with Google with traffic? You guys love that? You can do the bypass, you notice it's red, it's not moving, you'll take the surface streets, everybody else is doing that too, so it's blocked. But it's happening real time and you're watching that work. So differentiation happens in a couple ways. When we talk about sensor and analytical ecosystems, one of our analysts, Joseph DiPolantonio, is looking at this. And if my car is connected to my gas tank, which is connected to my phone, which is linked up to the Google map, which is linked up to an ad network, something interesting happens. I might pay a dollar a month for an app that allows me to surface up all the gas stations when I'm out of gas, right? That's awesome, I'll pay a dollar. But guess what? The gas station might pay $5,000 a month to you to put an offer for a hot dog and a Coke and a fill up to the person nearest that's out of gas. And that's what the business model is. You're happy, you're excited, it's a brand new service. Did you do anything different? No, the data was in front of you. You just made it available. You provided context. It was relevant, and I want that, and I'll pay for that. That's what we're trying to get to. And it's so simple. It already happens today. Think about UPS and FedEx with tracking a package. The data was there anyways. Now we're like, it's on the dock. It's left the dock. It's moving on the truck, right? It's gone to the facility. It's moved from the facility onto the plane. Right? Did you really need that much info? Maybe, maybe we're all anal, maybe we like that level of detail, but that is a differentiator. I'm excited, I know where my package is. Now, if they could allow me to intercept the truck on Waze and get there before 4 p.m., cut them off at 11, I'll pay another $5 for that service. You see how this works? information-based differentiation. It's simple, don't think big, don't try to carve out the world. There is so much money to be made here on these business models. Now the second one is interesting. We're all in the cloud. We're looking at information brokering, right? This is benchmarking data. This is sharing sets of information, aggregate information, privacy. I'm a big privacy freak, so make sure that you're following the privacy rules. These are all opt-in. But I got aggregated sets of information, government data, bringing that all together. Now, if I know a bushel of wheat, I don't know the prices right now, but I assume it's about $25 a bushel, and I know that there are thousands of containers in Oakland coming back from China empty, and I know that wheat prices could be high in some area because of a drought, I'll pay you $50,000 a month for that data because I'm going to arbitrage the crap out of this thing. Because I'm going to figure out it's $50 a bushel in Turkmenistan, fine, and it's 23 here and it cost me $5 to move that on the, on the boat. Wow, I'm in. I will pay you for that data. And you know what? The people with the boats have no clue that data's worth something. The people that's telling you how much a bushel of wheat is have no clue how much that's worth it. It's these brokerages that are gonna happen, right? Take that data, combine it with something, push a button, find out the insights, figure out what's next. These are complete awesome business opportunities for any startup here. How do you get there? How do you make this happen? The data's there and all this, all this effort to create free information and Gov2.0 and open data problems. They're happening right now. You've got to take advantage of them. Now, the last one is a little bit difficult. And why this is difficult is because it's a network model. These information-based business platforms come down to something. I'll make it really simple for you. And I'm going to ask you this question. How many vendors can deliver from cloud to device in the world? How many people own the network? Name out the names. Google. Which one? Apple. Who else? Amazon, who else? Who, which one? Microsoft, that's it, that's the four. You are either the network, the content, or an arms dealer, and I'll tell you right now, you are not the network. And no telco is the network, they're gonna come kill me later, but they are not the network, they've missed the boat again, okay? Here's why, if I can go from cloud to device, I now own the whole interaction between you and something else. And when I own that network, you quickly realize that your content, which is the information we're gonna broker, or something differentiated, you might aggregate content, like Viacom does today with TV channels, 
But there's going to be aggregation, there's going to be contextual aggregation, there's going to be ad networks, there's going to be deal rooms, there's going to be all these things that pop up because we aggregate this information. And even more importantly, there are going to be companies that are arms dealers that are just helping enable that. If you're in this room as a vendor or startup, you've got to figure that out real quick. And now you can start figuring out who you partner with to deliver on this. You have to be on one of these networks if you're going to win. And I, I, will, I wouldn't bet on a startup that's not on one of these networks or has a deal with one of these companies because that's where the future of these big data business models are going. Some might say Facebook, but arguably no. Until they own that complete channel from cloud content to your network in your hand, they're not going to be able to play in that space. They have a lot of content and they can play in a lot of networks. They can make a ton of money, but they're a content player. They're not a network play, and that's what's important. So you take these three models and you can expand it even more. Connected worlds and collaboration. All these things about the future of work in different rooms. Think about this. We talked about five generations of workers. People are working from home. How many of you guys worked from home seven years ago? How many work from home today? That's a little bit better. It's about half the room. But that's the point, right? We've changing the way we work. And so how we connect in, some of us are part-time workers, some of us are full-time. Given the current healthcare state, we could all be part-time workers. But what does that mean? We're connecting into different rooms. We're going to co-working, co-location spaces. And this connectivity is actually creating new models. Think about companies like Odesk. They're brokering against the data of who's available, who's trained, how to connect them into different areas, pop them into a virtual office, now you've got projects, and basically businesses are project-based. And we're seeing that right now, and that's a big disruption. What I want now, I want to know who you are. I want trust and transparency. I want to know your reputation. There are going to be trust agents that emerge, and these trust agents are going to be the ones that then say, oh yeah, this guy is definitely certified in Java, but you know what, don't rent him a car, he'll destroy it. Right? This guy completely gets you know, how to program and how to run a Hadoop instance and do an HTS file, perfect. But you know what? Don't rent him a home, he'll destroy it. That's the context that we're doing, these personal reputation engines. We are talking about pclouds earlier, but it's more than that. We're creating reputation indices everywhere. We live in digital exhaust everywhere, and that's being traded. We've seen this. This is the GE industrial internet model, right? Planes are coming in, people are figuring out when I talk to the plane, when an engine needs to be repaired, what happens at the airport, a sensor is out. That's another set of models. And once again, GE is a pioneer in this. They are not selling anything that's hardware related. They're selling you the peace of mind. You want to run that plane? I'll keep that thing up all the time. I'll get you an engine. Pay me $10 million a year. And I'll make sure that you never go down. And if it goes down, I will swap an engine and you'll be up running. You want to worry about your aircraft predictive maintenance models? Same thing. This is the change that's happening in the marketplace. Augmented reality. I'm going to be at Inside AR, which is the Mateo conference, in about a few weeks. And look at what they're doing. Companies that are in the AR field, they're creating brand new models. This is information experience. It's more than Google Glass. It's going to happen at the chip level. It's going to be embedded in every device. And when it's in the device, now we're surfing interesting models. I'm a real estate agent. You guys have all probably seen the old layer model where you see the real estate agent. Someone's in, Copen someone's in Amsterdam and they're trying to figure out which home is for sale. Information pops up. School information pops up as a layer. Crime statistics. You get information all around you that's being surfaced up. That's not just advertising. This is, this is curated content that people are willing to pay for. That's a very, very different kind of model when we look at this. And then there's this issue of matrix commerce. What does the buyer really want? Which channels are important to them? What are the demand signals? What do they click on? What do they look at? What happened? Is that the same profile? Is that the same person? Wait, is that buy, is it person at work or is that person at home? What's the difference here? All that's being aggregated around the big data. So what channels being used? What demand signals are being created? What supply chains are being activated? What digital identities and securities are happening? This whole world of commerce is going to change in three years because of data. All right, where do we go with this? Other than I got 55 seconds to talk really, really fast. No, that's not the case. Let me talk about where you are. Think about your organizational DNA. This is the most important thing because this is going to dictate how fast you're going to move. And if you are a market leader, which is you are transformational and you are proactive, that's 5% of the world. Okay? That means you're ready to go. You're moving already. You're doing some big data project. You're ready to go first. There's only 5% of you. 
If you're a fast follower, you're reactive. You're saying, I'm not going to go until the leader moves. Think about Panasonic. They are not a fast follower. They're not a market leader in anything that I can think of, right? But you know what? They're still around. They make more money than Sony, and they move just as quick. If Sony launched something, two months later, they had something else. That's what I'm talking about as a fast follower. That's 15% of the market, and you can do really well. And fast followers are like, can I do it faster, better, cheaper than anybody else? Now, when we look at the next set, these are laggards. Most people are laggards. That's 50% of the market. You know you're a laggard when you talk to a reference and you're done, and then you go talk to another reference, and then you have to maybe do a POC, let's do a proof of concept, and then somebody else is like, oh, no, 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 you gotta do an ROI study. Good God, by the time you're done, the competitor's already kicked your butt, all right? But you're a laggard, and most companies are laggards, and we get it, right? Something has to happen. A year later, you make the decision, everybody's already moved, right? That's how you know you're a laggard, or cautious adopter, sorry. Now, the laggards are very interesting because laggards just don't care. Laggard's like, whatever, you know, unless there's a merger, unless there's a change, unless we go bankrupt, we're not moving. Things are still the same. And that's 30% of the population. And what's important here is the cautious adopters know they gotta move, they just move really slow. The laggards don't care. So laggards become fast followers very quickly when something cataclysmic happens. New management, new CEO, buyout. That's when laggards take action and become fast followers. And this is important. Okay, so how do you adopt all this stuff? Real quick, we have a deeper framework. First part is discovery. Get, a, get someone in there early, try out a data project, bring an executive in there, tie it back to a business process. Tie it back to use case. Ken gave you a million use cases to look at. Tie it back to use case so you'll be successful. Because if you don't measure it, you don't know if this project's gonna succeed. And you need metrics that matter. Once you do that, evangelize it, get it everywhere. Put it everywhere inside the organization. You might find out there are 15 projects going on, but that's okay. Talk it out. And once you've done that, it becomes pervasive, right? It's now there, and you know what? It's not a real project unless you get funding. And that funding happens because you have an executive sponsor, which is in D, in Discovery. That happens because metrics are there and you are following a business process that you are impacting. That's actually E. And then what happens is because you've worked with all the teams and you made it in a department, you moved it to a division, you got it inside the company, you got your suppliers and partners to do it, you've moved this thing across the life cycle, that's why it's in the budget. That's how you get it to P. And then realization, that's fun. You now have this, you're figuring out what technologies, what tools, what processes you're not going to do. Because the most important thing in strategy is knowing what you're not gonna do. That is harder than figuring out what you're gonna do and you now are in a position to do that and you'll be successful. All right, how do you pitch this stuff? I'm gonna give you five ways how you can pitch a project inside your organization and get funding. The bottom one is the best. Don't get killed, don't get sued, and don't get fired. Right, that's regulatory compliance. Every CFO will sign up. So scare the crap out of the CFO and you'll have a project. All right, um, there's operational efficiency. Every dollar I spend is, a dollar, is $3 I save. There's growth. Every dollar I spend is $3 I make. And then there's strategic differentiation. And those were where the business models were. You're ready to change. You're a fast follower or market leader. You will go after strategic differentiation. You will use big data as your weapon. You will trade your data to fund a project. That's how you know you're ready for strategic differentiation. The bottom stuff anybody can do. I can scare any CFO into something. I'll find some regulation that they don't know about, right? But when you're really strategic, it's differentiation. And when you tie that back to your brand value, that's when you're gonna be successful. All right, how do you do this? Figure out who the heck you are as a company. Know that organizational persona. Know it well. Once you do that, begin with the end in mind. Even Stephen Covey? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you're a consultant, you have five copies in paperback. Anyways, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Begin with the end in mind. Once you have that, what's that path look like? These are the journey maps. I don't care if it's an employee journey map, supplier journey map, customer journey map. You are making process swim lanes. You're trying to figure out where can I impact the organization. Figure out what data is important. That's the data you want to work with. Hint, it's the one you have, not the one you want. Please work with the stuff you have already. And then the free stuff, and then if you have other things you want to pay, you pay for it because it's highly curated, it's high quality, and it's going to add a lot of value. And then test out different architectures. There's all this stuff out there. It's time to experiment to be successful. And then you start figuring out patterns. 
These are the patterns that you start saying, now I get it. I understand why people are buying these things. I understand what's moving a market. I see patterns emerging. I want to test those patterns. Fail fast. And last thing, data quality, MDM, all this stuff in governance, they will come at a later point in time. But if you don't get that right, you are going to fail. And you have to make sure that happens. All right, so that's it. Big picture, world's falling apart. No, just kidding. Big picture, lots of things are happening in the market. Massive amounts of change. Disruptive business models are happening in every sector. Data is your weapon to get there. Follow the data to decisions path and you will be successful. Use the deeper adoption framework so you can get a project and start experimenting. Fail fast and have fun. Thank you very much.